The next speaker is uh, Dr. Wim Dones. Uh, Wim um, is a research director um, at CNRS. Uh, he is, is working at uh, LabCD Lab at University of Paris City uh, since uh, 2012. And before joining CNRS, he worked at the University of Leuven in Belgium, at York University in Toronto, and uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So his research explores how human thinking relies on prior knowledge uh, and intu intuitive beliefs, and how these uh, beliefs and intuitions are uh, affecting people's reasoning. So I now uh, leave the floor to you, Wim, um, for your talk on fast and slow. Thank you very much. Okay, hi everyone. I'm going to start my talk with a very simple question. If you look at these two pictures, which one of these two individuals looks like the most typical black person to you? If I would ask you to rate them on a scale from 0 to 10, 0 being totally now black, 10 being this is like the very prototypical black guy, <clears throat> what rating would you give each one of them? Now, in a very famous study that was published about a decade ago, Jennifer Eberhardt from Stanford University gave pictures just such as these ones to her undergrads. And she asked them, just like I asked you, to rate them how prototypical black these persons actually looked. What the undergrads did not know was that these pictures were actually taken from defendants at criminal trials, at murder trials. So these people were at risk of receiving the death penalty. Okay? And what her study showed was that the single best predictor of whether or not someone was actually sentenced to death were her students' stereotype ratings. So the more black a person looked, the higher the probability that this person was being sentenced to death. So to me, this is still one of the most striking examples of biases in our decision making. You would expect that if we were to make a really important decision, quite literally in this case, a matter of life and death, you would expect that we would base our decision on objective criteria, that we would really think it through, look at, in the case of a jury decision making, at aggravating and mitigating causes, look at, for example, the number of suspects in the case, the criminal record of the suspect, etc. But apparently, what seems to be going on is that our decisions, jury decision making, is often driven by intuitive stereotypes. Intuitively, we feel we associate black with bad, criminal, so the more black you look, the higher the probability that you're being sentenced to death. Okay. Now, in the field of uh, reasoning and decision making, we have developed a number of classic, by now classic tasks that allow us to study this bias. And I'm going to show you an example because it's one of the tasks that I'll be, gonna, I'll be using in the different studies that I'm going to talk about. This is called the base rate neglect problem. Basically, you get some information about the composition of a sample. You're being told, okay, we've got 1,000 people in the sample, 995 Democrats and five Republicans. We're drawing someone randomly from the sample, and we're going to give you a short description of this person. And you're being told in this case, well, this person lives in Texas, works in the oil business, and he believes in traditional marriage. Now, the description is constructed such that it will cue a strong stereotypical response that makes you think of a Republican because of the things that he's doing, sort of like a right-wing conservative uh, person. And what most people in this case, like even intelligent university students, if, if you ask them what is most likely, is this person a Democrat or Republican? Most people, 80% of your uh, test subjects will say, okay, this is a Republican. Now, if you would only get the description, that might be a valid response. But in this case, you're also being informed about the base rates in the sample. You're being told that there are far more Democrats in the sample than Republicans. So of course, logically speaking, if you're going to draw randomly from the sample where there are 995 Democrats and only five Republicans, it's become far more likely that the person that you're going to draw will be a Democrat. But that's not what most people seem to be doing. Most people seem to be neglecting the base rates and they just base their decision on the intuitive stereotype that's being cued in the task. Okay? 
Now, in the field of reasoning and decision making in the last 50 years, half a century, there's been a gazillion examples of this type of bias. In a lot of situations, tasks, people fail to reason logically. They're not taking logical, probabilistic, objective criteria into account. Why? Because they seem to be basing their decisions on simple rule of thumbs, so-called heuristic, things like stereotypical beliefs, intuitive feelings. Okay? And this is often biasing our decision making in real, in real life too. I gave you the example of jury decision making, but the very reason that you're organizing this workshop, uh, workshop just think about like hiring decisions. Of course, from a logical, normative point of view, if you're trying to recruit someone, you should base your decision on objective criteria. You, know, you want the best person for the job. But we know that often these types of decisions in real life will be biased by stereotypical beliefs. Okay. Now, all this talk about bias might lead you to the conclusion, okay, so basically what psychological research has been showing is that people are stupid. We cannot reason. Okay. But that paradox is more apparent than real. Because you might argue, well, wait a second. You're telling me that people cannot reason, but on the other hand, we're like the most technologically advanced species on the planet. We've put one of our own on the moon. So clearly, human beings have to be smart. Now, the issue here, the question is not whether or not people are smart or stupid. Clearly, people are intelligent beings. The issue is rather that even very smart people can sometimes do really stupid things, right? And to make sense of that paradox, in the field of reasoning and decision-making research, people have come up with what is being referred to as dual process or dual systems theory. And the basic idea is very simple. The idea is that people do not have one system to make decisions, but two, a first system and a second system. And they're typically being referred to as system one and system two. And the first system is our intuitive reasoning system that is really fast and effortless. And that is skewing these often stereotypical responses. It's useful because it's really fast. We also have a second system that is slower and is more effortful. It requires cognitive resources. It's hard to activate your system too. It's being referred to as the deliberate system, the logical reasoning system. It's this system that allows you to reason uh, in accordance with normative standards, logic, probabilities, etc. Okay. Now, in and by itself, the first intuitive system is super useful, and it's important to stress this, right? Why? Because in a lot of situations, it will queue valid problem solutions, and it's super fast, and that's helpful. Okay? Imagine that you're a caveman. You're walking around in the bushes. All of a sudden, a saber-toothed tiger jumps up in front of you. At that point, what you're going to do is you're not going to sit down and think things through. If you would do that, you wouldn't survive. No, you're going to use your system one and go for an intuitive reaction and just going to run as fast as possible. So this is a very useful system for human beings. The problem is simply that sometimes the two systems will cue conflicting responses. And in that case, we need our system two, our deliberate logical system, to correct the intuitively generated responses. OK? Now, the problem there is that we're human beings. We're so-called cognitive misers. What that means is we're all lazy. We don't like to do things that are hard. So often we're not going to engage in that system two thinking because it demands cognitive resources. It's slow. It takes time. It's hard to think really deep, right? So we're just going to stick to the intuitively cute solution, and we will not notice that this intuitive solution is actually conflicting with more normative, logical, probabilistic considerations. Okay? So that's a very useful framework to make sense of these biases. On one hand, in theory, like, yes, people are smart, intelligent, we can't reason logically, but often in practice we're fallible and we won't because we're sticking to these intuitively cute decisions because we're often lazy. Okay? Now, this is a, right now, this dual process, dual system theory is super popular in psychological, economical research. Why? Because it's a very appealing story. It's simple, it's accessible, right? It resonates with classic distinctions like Plato already talked about the conflict between our intuitions and ratio. So it seems to be making sense. And also in 2002, one of the godfathers of the field, of the dual process field, Daniel Kahneman, was awarded Nobel Prize in Economics. He wrote a best-selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow, about this view on human thinking. So that further boosted the popularity of the framework.
But it's also important to mention that this framework is also being criticized. Why? Because it's giving you a really good story, but often some of the really more detailed processing mechanisms are not clear. Okay? And I'm going to show you an example because it's important, um, I feel, even uh, when today we're talking to a wider audience, to give you somewhat of the scientific nuts and bolts, the methodology behind these uh, frameworks that uh, scientists are putting forward. So what's the problem that the classic theory is conceiving biased thinking, the nature of this bias within this view is a detection failure, okay? If you want to take logical, probabilistic, normative considerations into account, you need to activate your system too. But that's hard, we're all lazy, so often we're not going to do it. So why are we being biased? Because we're not detecting that our intuitive system is doing something that conflicts with these more normative, reflective, deliberate considerations that require activation of system two. Now that is, sounds appealing, but in theory there's also an alternative solution or possibility. It might be that people are detecting that what they're doing is not completely warranted. They're feeling that there's a problem with this intuitively cute problem solution, but nevertheless, they stick to it because this intuitive stereotypical solution is more tempting. It's more convincing. So people are, might be taking both into account, but they're just giving more weight to the stereotype. Okay? And in that view, actually, your failure to reason correctly is not a detection failure, no. You're detecting that there's something wrong with your response, but you just fail to block it, to override it. And just to give you an idea, like you might think of an analogy here, uh, think about addictions, right? The first view is saying, for example, why do we all keep on smoking? The first view is saying, well, you're smoking because you're not realizing that smoking is bad for you. But that hasn't necessarily doesn't need to be true. It might be, as in the case of smoking, that you do know that smoking is bad for you, but that's not sufficient. That doesn't suffice to make you quit smoking, right? It requires something else. It requires you to block this tempting tendency to light another cigarette. Okay? So those are two different views on the nature of bias, a detection failure versus a correction failure. And it's important to be clear about this because it has implications for our view of human rationality. Are people stupid or smart? If we are at least detecting that there's something wrong with these biased intuitions that we're generating, that might give us uh, something to work with when we're talking about interventions, right? If the nature of um, bias is different, then we need a different type of intervention. For example, if the problem would be that people don't know the logical rules, then we should teach them the logical rules, and that will allow them to actually detect conflict. But if people are already detecting that there's something wrong with these intuitively cute problem solutions, if they are at least implicitly already taking some deliberate normative considerations into account, then simply telling people, hey, watch out, what you're doing is not right, that's not going to help them, right? It would be telling a smoker, hey, watch out, smoking is bad for you. It's like, duh, I know, but you need something more. So nature of bias is important when we're talking about potential interventions to help people make better decisions. And that's something that I with my team here in Paris, what we've been working on for the last 10 years. And how are we doing this? And I think it's important that I tell you a little bit about this. We do this by presenting people classic reasoning task in which an intuitively cute response will conflict with the correct logical response. Just as in the example with the Democrats and the Republicans that I showed you, but then we're also going to give people control problems in which both our intuitions and logic do the exact same response. And just to give you an idea, that's what I mean. So here you have on top, you have the classic version. That's what I just show you. And here we have a control version in which we're going to introduce a small content transformation. We're just going to switch the base rates around. So now both the description and the numbers, the base rates, are cueing the exact same response. Both are telling you, in this case, it's a Republican. And what we're going to see is whether or not people process these two versions differently. Right? If people would simply totally disregard the logical implications, they neglect the base rate information, then their processing of these two versions shouldn't be different. Because the only difference is that we switch the base rates around. If you neglect the base rates, then you should just process them in the exact same way. If, however, people are already detecting over here that there's a problem that these both 
the numbers and the description cue conflicting responses, you'd expect that people are going to take a little bit longer over here because they'll be in doubt. They're detecting that this intuitively cute response is not completely valid. So they'll be less confident, take a bit more time. And that's exactly what we're trying to test in the uh, experiments on bias detection. Right? And by now, like over the last 10 years, there's a range of finding that is indicating that indeed people are sensitive to their biases, at least in these logical reasoning tasks. If people are giving a biased response to these conflict versions, they typically take longer than when they're solving the control versions. They're less confident that the response is actually correct. You can also study their eye movements. And what's going on is when they see a conflict problem, they'll start by reading the base rate information on top, about 995 Democrats and five Republicans. Then they switch to the description, start reading the description. And for the conflict problems, what's happening is people start making eye movements back to the base rate information. So they're reinspecting the base rate information for the conflict versions, and they're not doing that in the control versions when both are queuing the exact same response. So suggesting that they are picking up on the fact that they have to process and pay attention to this base rate information. Okay. You can also look at brain activation. There's a certain specific uh, area in, in the brain, it's called the anterior cingulate cortex, that is often involved when people are uh, facing a conflict, when they're making errors, and we see that this exact same region is activated during these types of uh, decision-making tasks when people are making biased decisions. So a lot of evidence that's suggesting that people show some basic sensitivity to their biases. Okay. So my take-home message for you is like, what I tried to show you is, yes, it's true, like research is showing you that people are very often biased, and a popular framework to make sense of this is the dual process, fast and slow account, okay? But that account is making some assumptions about the nature of bias that do not seem completely valid. The classic idea is that people are biased because they fail to detect that there's something wrong with their intuitions. By now, there's more and more evidence suggesting that people are showing some basic sensitivity to their errors, it's just that they fail to correct these very tempting intuitive solutions. So they're giving more weight to their intuition, yes, but they're not completely blind to the fact that they might be doing something that's not completely valid or warranted. And that's giving some silver lining, it points to potential de-bias interventions, okay? I want to stress that this is like fundamental research, people are being tested in the lab, but it might have some real life implications if you want to help people, it suggests at least that we might look at these training people's ability to override their erroneous intuitions. Okay, that's it. I'm going to stop preaching here and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>